welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. So this is our um, first lab-driven uh, colloquium of the season. Um, I'm pleased to, my name is Brian Curlis. I'm a professor in Grail, which is the graphics and imaging laboratory. Um, and I'm happy to introduce the Grail Colloquium today. Um, not what this title slide is about, it's about the first talk, but um, so it's, it's called the Graphics and Imaging Laboratory, but it's actually an umbrella for a lot of um, different kinds of research, as you'll see today from CAD programs, from a kind of a programming a debugging point of view to CAD programs that are assisted by deep learning to, um, well, uh, we did have a talk on traditional uh, graphics using vision. Unfortunately, um, that was the middle talk. Uh, she couldn't make it today. She wasn't uh, feeling well. Um, so um, sorry about that. But we do have a total of five talks otherwise. Um, so additionally, spanning a more tr uh, kind of deep learning driven graphics kind of project using modern diffusion models. Um, uh, to audio, um, which has uh, nothing to do with imaging, but is uh, critically important for um, for experiences for for users um, in the graphics space, um, and finally a vision robotics kind of talk. Um, so, anyway, a pretty broad swath of talks. Um, I'm. Uh, it's been a few years since Grail has had a colloquium. Um, and we've actually hired two new faculty who will, uh, their students and postdocs will be presenting some work today, including um, uh, one working with Gilbert Bernstein um, and another working with Ranjay Krishna. So those are the two new faculty. And then we have a whole suite of postdocs and students to present their exciting work today. So their, their talks will be maybe more like about six minutes each with uh, time for questions in between each one. Um, so. Why don't we get started? Felix is up first. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, my name is, uh, is Felix. Uh, I'm a postdoc, um, and this is a, a collaboration with Gilbert Bernstein and Adriana Schultz, and it's called uh, Debugging CAT Programs. So computer-aided design for short CAT is a very general term, but in our context, we are interested in, um, in these tools which allow us to create parametric 3D models. And the usual workflow for creating these models is by creating some planar sketches first um, out of simple primitives such as rectangles and circles. And afterwards, these sketches are used by other operations to create or modify 3D geometry such as these extrude oper uh, operations. <clears throat> the, um, while modeling, the user implicitly creates a list of parametric um, constructive operations. And each of them takes some input arguments which are either um, geometric entities, such as the face of the sketch, or other design parameters, such as this extrusion depth. And these um, CAT operators can be thought of as function calls, and therefore this entire modeling sequence as a CAT program. What I just showed you was inspired by a real-world example from a user who designed a magnifying glass holder for their tool shelf. And this example will guide us through the rest of this talk. What people are really interested in um, uh, in, in CAT um, and the, really the strength of CAT is that you can come back on intermediate design decisions, do an edit, and all downstream operations will be automatically updated. However, sometimes these automatic updates can lead to unexpected changes. In this example, changing the dimensions of this sketch rectangle somehow split this part into two, and we even have some execution errors there in red um, uh, in this operation list. Without going into too much detail, because this is um, supposed to be a five minute talk, um, the high level reason for this happening is that CAT operations, as I just said, take as input existing geometry. And now, if an upstream operation changes its output geometry, such as the sketch before and after the edit, Downstream operations, such as this extrude operation, now have to figure out what new geometry to take as an input. This is an ill post problem since you can't really read the user's mind, and, um, uh, and the most that we can do is really to guess the intended change from the user. Um, and in modern CAD systems, this is exactly what, what is being done. Um, they are using automatic heuristic based algorithm to do that guesswork for the user, which can lead to unexpected changes. Confronted with these errors, um, uh, users will have to try to figure out the differences in their CAD programs before and after the edit by regenerating the model at different time steps, 
in the modeling timeline and by switching back and forth um, uh, to states before and after the edit. One of our key insights is that these kinds of scenarios um, happen actually really frequently, which we observed on a data set of real world uh, modeling sequences. And we're therefore interested in this project to actually um, propose a debugging tool which is tailored for these kinds of scenarios. So without further ado, um, uh, I'm introducing you to our tool. So based on um, observations of users' modeling sequences and um, from formative interviews which we had with CAT experts, we are proposing a tool which aims to facilitate the discovering process, the discovering process of differences in your CAT program. In the top row, what you can see is how the model worked before the edit, and in the bottom row, we can see what changed after the edit. Brushing over an operation will highlight what geometric entities have been used as an input, and we can toggle on or off um, reference arrows to existing geometry input, which help us to discover more long-range dependencies. In the, in this debugging view can be customized um, by hiding um, different parts or operations. Um, without having to wait for, to, for the, um, to regenerate the entire model. In short, this um, debugging tool helps the user to easily gather information about the modeling sequence and to visually reason about the underlying program structure. And finally, yeah, and finally once the, the source of the problem has been identified, we can um, leave this debugging view and the uh, contained information open to the right and use the information to uh, fix our problem, which we just did. Just let the videos load here. There seems to be, right. Uh, so just here, once again, to emphasize what we are changing with our project. Um, here's a split screen a comparison between, um, on, uh, on the left, um, the previous baseline debugging workflow, and on the right, the debugging workflow, which is enabled by our tool. Something um, which maybe doesn't come across um, in the video, but which is worth pointing out, is that in the baseline debugging workflow, there's a huge cognitive load imposed on the user since they have to just to regenerate the model and they have to remember um, uh, how the model, model worked at, um, each, at each different state that they have visited. Whereas in our tool, everything is outlined in front of the user and the user can customize, um, they can choose the information which they want to, um, to display. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, so the debugging tool seems really helpful for looking at like an overview of uh, how the model changes. If you've got a really complicated model, um, is it harder to see the details of what's changing? Uh, or do you need, is there a way to like, zoom in? Yeah, so the question is, um, so um, on this simplified example, well, not it's still a real-world example, but on this rather simple example, um, uh, this seems to work out well, but on more complex geometry, I guess, um, uh, it could be hard to figure out what the changes are. Uh, that's a good point. We haven't really, um, we haven't really tackled the problem of uh, highlighting what geometric differences are. Uh, which could be done by, for example, um, display, uh, go, go, um, having the option to um, display um, the difference volume, let's say, um, the, just the difference shape between, between before and after the edit. That's one option that one can easily think of. Um, we, haven't, we haven't tried that yet. Uh, I think the, the, um, the kind of mindset in this problem is that um, we don't have to do anything algorithmic. Um, uh, when we, if we just give the user, um, if we just empower the user with um, easy visualization tools, basically. Um, but maybe we will try that out. Uh, we should, I think, yeah. yeah. That's a good point. Thank you for the question. Well, thanks. It's yeah. really thanks. Have you, um, so you did a user study to kind of validate the initial concept, have you done user studies since implementing it to see how it's received? Not yet, no. Um, okay. We know that, that, that this is a problem of interest, um, which we have from, we, we have talked with people who have a lot of CAT expertise, and um, we also have access to a data set of um, actual model se modeling sequences, and this really happens a lot, um, but we have not validated the, the actual implementation yet, yeah. um, which will be exciting, I think. Um, I'm sure yeah. it'll happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Any other questions? One more. You mentioned in this data set that it happens quite often that an mm. operation breaks the downstream. Is there a way to 
classify or like get at the, like are they all stem from the same root cause or is it totally different each time? Um, so these arrows, um, arrows, um, they come with different uh, different labels. Um, sometimes it's um, it's just as vague as oh wow the modeling kernel couldn't um, regenerate the, mod the geometry, but sometimes it's also uh, it also actually de detects that um, a an input argument is now currently missing because uh, an upstream operation has changed that uh, that output geometry, um, and so we can we can use these that kind of information to uh, classify uh, these errors. So yeah. Um, you can enrich the tool later if there's uh, certain things you might want to visualize for certain types of... of yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah. Like. yeah, I think so, yeah. That you can enrich the tool later. Sorry, anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's it. Milan, take it away. All right. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melin Kodongbua, and um, this is the work uh, in collaboration with Benjamin Jones, Mas, Ahmad, Volumi Kim, and Adriana Charles. Uh, the work's titled Zero Chart CAD Program Reinformatization for Interactive Manipulation. Um, so it's very rele relevant to the previous talk somewhat. Um, so um, if you look around you, like most of the man-made object is probably made in CAD software. And so, like you know, a typical CAD model, they consist of a series of non-destructive operations, where each operation is, is defined by the geometry being operated on and the few parameters controlling the extent of the operation. So the beauty of CAD system is that you can go back to each of the operation and tweak the parameters, and the CAD system will automatically propagate the change and um, propagate the change accordingly. And this has taken over the world of uh, parametric modeling, and especially in industrial settings, where customizability and precision is very important. Um, in fact, this has been the vision of CAT since the early days of CAT. And so like, the goal is to create a system that would be flexible enough to encourage the engineer to easily consider a variety of designs and the cost of making design changes ought to be as zero as close as zero to as possible," said Samuel Giesberg, PTC founder in 1988. And it sounds like CAT is a perfect system, right? Well, um, 35 years later, this is not still the case. Um, well, it's true that you can modify the shape by simply editing, um, simply editing some parameters. The question is, what parameters do you need to change in order to satisfy your, your design intent? Say like you want to increase the width of the chair, which parameters do I have to go and change? Would it be the extrusion? Would it be the sketch that I need to change? Or would it be a combination of different parameters? The other problem is that um, depending on how you model this, um, CAD model, you might end up with an under-constrained uh, system where if you move something, everything else breaks. Um, and so in this work, we wanted to automatically discover a valid space of variations that doesn't break uh, the design intent. And so, um, and there are multiple ways you can do that. On one hand, if you just consider the space of variations of the construction operations defined by the CAT uh, system, you may end up, like I said earlier, you may end up in a design where things is not reasonable, where things break. The other thing we could do is we could infer some constraints based on the input model, and uh, we can end up having a very, um, very constrained design space. And so in this work, we uh, introduced reparam CAD, where it uses large language model, large image model, and also the symbolic reasoning to explore, explore and infer meaningful space of variations of the model. And so our key insight is that these pre-trained models have encoded 
some semantics and some shape understanding. And coupled with the symbolic reasoning, we retain the position of cat and make them somewhat re uh, interpretable. And so our, um, so given an input cat model and a text description, we first generate a, a number of text, uh, text prompt describing uh, different variations of the prompt. So we first put uh, this prompt into chat GPT, ask them what are different types of the objects here, the share, and it would typically output a list of different types along with a short description of the, the different types. And then a user can then extract these um, different types to create uh, various prompts. And now, uh, going back to the CAT, so our CAT program is defined as a simple uh, CSG with unions of primitives, cubes, and cylinders, each of which has uh, translation and scale parameters, and it would be um, uh, so different. Um. So in the next stage, we want to update the CAT parameters to match the text prompt, and we do that using uh, the help of this stable diffusion. So in the first stage, we want to render this CAD program in multiple angles. We feed them into the stable diffusion image-to-image -image pipeline give, uh, th that's conditioned on the renderings and the prompts. And that should give you a similar looking image where you can use pixel loss difference to backpropagate to update the CAD program. And by doing so, um, as you can see, the cap parameters would uh, update gradually to m match the, the text description. And so as you, as you notice, um, these output from this optimization loop might contain um, some noise and some imperfection to the arrangement of components. And so we want to find constraints that would help us um, eliminate this problem. Say, if the leg is attached to the seat of the chair, we want to make sure that it's really attached to the chair. So we want to uh, find a symbolic constraint that would um, find constraints that are common to all of these examples, and that should give us a nice space of variation. So for each of uh, primitives, these are the types of constraints you discover. We have coplanarity, coincidence, equality, and coaxial. Um, and so with the right amount of constraints, you can see that um, all of these parts snaps to its place, like reducing the noise from the stable diffusion process. Um, and with all these um, denoised uh, models with constraint, we use this example as a basis for uh, meaningful parameter uh, manipulation. And so these are results from uh, generating different models under this optimization loop with this stable diffusion. And you can see that our method is able to generate a variations of input model that's coherent with the text prompt and point out some of them, the soda bottle, the wine bottle, looks pretty much like what it is. And so like um, with all these, after we run the constraint discovery, we use them as the basis for manipulation and we end up discovering this nice space of variations of the input object. And I'll conclude the presentation, thank you. Nice. Any questions from the audience? It seems like one of the challenges is that you need to change topology in some cases to match the kind of, like to give the rocking chair rockers and things like that. I suppose that would be future work to add uh, right. functionality that isn't right. there. Right now we give a set of fixed topology. Right, so right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Any questions? All right, if not, thank you, thank you. awesome.
Uh, let's see, I think Lu Yang, you're next. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Lu Yang Zhu, and I'm a PhD student in Grill. And today I'm going to present um, my internship project um, uh, with Google, and it's called like Trial and Diffusion. Um, so before we go into the detail of the paper, we first see the task definition of this, uh, this project. So um, in this project, we are aiming to solve the image-based trial problem where the, there are two input images. One is the person A wearing a garment A, and the other is a person B wearing garment B. And our trial system aim to synthesize the look of the person A wearing the garment B. So basically, the top person wearing the garment of the bottom person. And uh, prior art uh, mainly solved this problem in like three stages. So uh, first, they given the person image and the target garment. They try to use a, a unit to generate the segmentation of the uh, source person wearing the target garment. And then, given this segmentation, they use it to guide the warping of the garment. Basically, they try to warp the, uh, or the source garment on top of the target person to fit your body size and body pose. And since this warping can introduce a lot of artifacts, so finally they have another like a unit to render the final trial result based on the warped garment and some other like uh, person poses. And the biggest problem in the prior art is in the second stage, the closed flow estimation. The reason is that there's actually um, no direct supervision for the flow. Unless we have a synthetic data, but it's on real data, it's really hard to calculate the dense flow uh, supervision to supervise the network. So what they did is like they tried to predict the flow and warp the garment and compute the perceptual loss between the ground truth and the warped garment. And uh, there's one problem is that, uh, as we can see in the left image, uh, the red dot can actually map to the two green dots, they all give us like desired results in the image space. So actually there's a ambiguity to supervise the flow in the perceptual space, especially for the garment where are the repetitive, there's a lot of repetitive like texture patterns. So the uh, explicit flow warping is a not good way to uh, warping the garment. And in this paper, we try to tackle this problem with an implicit warping uh, uh, implemented by the cross attention, and we also try to scale up the uh, rendering stage with uh, replace the original like generative adversarial network with uh, diffusion models. And finally, uh, instead of doing the trial in multiple stages, our model can implement the trial in a single uh, forward pass. Basically, we uh, combining the warping and blending. And uh, here is the pipeline overview of the uh, trial on diffusion. So first we get the person and garment, we do some pre-processing to get some conditional inputs from the two input images, including a clothing agnostic RGB, which we only keep the heads and hands and bottom garments of the person while removing the uh, all, all other like original garment. And for the garment input, we just segment out the garment from the uh, garment person image. And for both image, we compute the person pose and the garment pose. And then we synthesize the trial result at like three, uh, using three like diffusion models similar to the Imagine paper in cascaded ways. We first synthesize a trial result at like 120, 128 by 128 resolution, and then we super raise to 256. And the final one, uh, trial result is at like 1024 by 1024. So the, the key contribution to our uh, diffusion models is a uh, novel architecture tailored for the trial task. We call we call it parallel unit, as we have like two units. One is to process the uh, noisy image, which is the to do the denoising task, and the other one is to do the um, to process the garment image and apply cross attention between them. And for the first unit, the input is just a, a noise image concatenated with the coding agnostic RGB. And we use some like um, uh, unit architecture used, uh, used in Imagine and uh, Stable Diffusion. And in addition to the first unit, we, we have another uh, unit which only like to process the segmented garment. 
and then the green line here shows the segmented garment feature is used to uh, as a key value feature to do the cross attention, which is kind of like uh, warping the garment in an implicit way. Basically, the, the network will query uh, which pixel in the segmented garment is important to the final trial result. And this is kind of like an implicit warping. And besides that, we also do some like uh, fully connected layer to process the person pose and garment pose. And both the poses are used to modulate the unit through the add-in um, architecture here. And finally, we can get the denoise result uh, from the parallel unit. Um, here, I want to show some like quantitative results compared to the state-of-the-art uh, trial models. And we show on the left is uh, typical like uh, FID and KID used in like unpaired image synthesis. And on the right, we also do some user study to compare to the uh, prior arts. And it shows that our results can be the uh, previous uh, methods uh, at like more than like 90% of the time. And here is like some qualitative comparison. Like um, the leftmost column is like um, input garment and input person, and the middle three column is the state of the art results, and the rightmost is our results. We can see that our model can like warp the garment onto diff a person of different body shapes and under a heavy self-occlusion and challenging poses. And here's like more like trial results. Uh, the leftmost column is the garment, the top, the top row is the person, and the median one is the person trying on that garment. And we can see our model can handle like various garment types and for various person under like different poses, skin tones, and body shapes. And this is for woman trial. And uh, here is more results. The left is for uh, man top trial, and the right is uh, more of the uh, woman top trial. Um, yeah. So uh, that's all I present today. And if you're interested, you can like scan the code to see uh, more results and details on our project website. Um, thank you. Cool. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, we'll start here. Uh, do you maybe see yourself putting this into like a video format down the line to maybe one day be like something you can try on in like augmented reality? Uh, uh, yeah, so the question is like if we can like uh, put these results in the video format so that we can use in the like uh, augmented uh, reality or virtual reality. Yeah. yeah, so currently we are like only support uh, the image based trial, but uh, definitely the video trial is the next step because like you know in the real like virtual trial experience, you really want to see like how the garment dynamics moves when your body moves. So yeah, it's Definitely interesting, and we can like maybe seek some like advancement in the video like diffusion domain to see if we can achieve that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, with respect to like a possible extension, which is um, like so you can uh, generate these um, garments on different, different body shapes and for different poses. Could you get get from that a certain material understanding or three D understanding of your garment? Okay. Um. So. Uh, the question is like, um, is the cross attention like um, learning, like implicitly learn some like three D or like um, um, geometry like information in that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, explicit, some explicit information. Yeah, yeah, getting some like explicit information like um, in in three D. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Like actually, like. I think like before we started this like um, paper, like we are kind of like surprised to see like it can really learn the like geometry of shadows like pretty good in some ways, and and we think it's kind of like our data set is super large, and the model did like implicitly learn how to like uh, shade or like rely those garments based on poses or even the background light. But currently we don't have an explicit way, for example, to disentangle. All those like uh, like um, like three D like geometry or shading or like garment dynamics uh, information. It's kind of like 
or like kind of mixed in the cross attention module. But it would be interesting to explore if we can kind of like separate those information out. Then we can do a lot of more like editing tasks for Tryon. For example, we can change the wrinkles or we can like relight or do a lot of like other tasks. But currently it's kind of like all mixed in the cross attention map, yeah. A quick follow-up, and then we should move on. Yeah. And so, just from a, I guess, product perspective, um, just if you have um, on the internet a garment which has a fixed size, yeah. Um, can you any control over your result not changing the size of the garment? I, I guess not. But, um, yeah. So I think we. Yeah. So currently, we, for example, you can try on, the the try on result will all, always like fit the target person's body shape. And uh, we cannot do the fitting task. For example, we have a small size of person, and you try on a large size of person, it will show it's very like uh, tight or not. We cannot do that. We we don't do we we don't solve the fitting in try on. We just synthesize the look to 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 try on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Lu yeah. Yang. Vivek, you're up. All right. Thanks so much. My name is Vivek Jaram, and today I'm going to be talking about HRTF estimation in the wild. So what is an HRTF? Why might we want to estimate this? Why might we want to do this in the wild? You're about to find out. And this is joint work with my advisor, Stephen Ira, and we are presenting this at WIST in San Francisco next week. So imagine a world where you were wearing your headphones and sound actually sounded like it was coming from everywhere around you. For example, you might be in a virtual reality gaming environment and you need to know that the bad guy's behind you so you can turn around. Or you might be trying to experience a concert in virtual reality and you want to hear all the different instruments coming from different directions. Or even if you're just watching some content uh, Apple, Sony, all of these companies are putting out tons of 3D and, and uh, mixed reality content, and you want to experience it in the full surround sound, but you're only wearing the headphones. So how can we trick your brain into thinking that sound is coming from all different directions when you're only wearing headphones? This phenomenon is called head-related transfer function, and this is what allows you to localize sources in the real world. So let's say that you have a sound source coming from some direction, the sound that reaches your left ear and your right ear are going to be different, and it's going to vary based on a number of individual factors, such as your head shape, your ear shape, and all these different personalized factors. And by seeing your brain knows, um, has sort of built up its own model of how your head and ears are affecting the sound. So you can know that a sound's coming from behind you because certain frequencies have been cut in certain ways. You can sort of think of this as an audio fingerprint uh, that's unique to each individual. And the key problem here is that when we're trying to render content for that individual, we need to render it with that same frequency cuts and frequency boosts that they would experience in the real world in order for them to actually feel like it's coming from all around them. Um, and so a core problem in spatial audio and virtual reality is measuring an individual person's HRTF. Now, unfortunately, existing methods to measure uh, your head-related transfer function are very complicated. For example, you might sit in an anechoic chamber with all these speakers around you. Um, you might have to take complex 3D head scans and, and create meshes with uh, different simulation methods. Um, other methods involve taking detailed measurements of your head and your ear in order to predict how your head is filtering sounds. Um, but we imagine a new world in which you can get your head-related transfer function in everyday environments. And we rely on two key observations. The first observation is that millions of people in the world are now walking around wearing earbuds that have a microphone in each ear, and they also have a head-tracking gyroscope. So you can actually track your head and record audio into both ear from like, what your ears are hearing uh, just using your AirPods. And the second observation is that sound that's captured in everyday environments as you rotate your head provide clues about your HRTF. So here's a spectrogram image of a sound in the environment as I'm rotating my head. And you can see that the frequencies are changing in different ways. And we can sort of start to see which frequencies are being boosted and which frequencies are being cut. Uh, and this is actually providing clues as to how my head and my ears are filtering all these frequencies. 
So our key question is, can we estimate your HRTF as you move your head about in everyday environments? So now I'll show an overview of our method. Hi there. It might look like I'm just working and listening to music, but I'm actually getting my personalized HRTF measured at the same time. Nowadays, headphones have a microphone in each ear, and they also have head tracking abilities. As I rotate my head around, my earbuds are capturing the sounds of the washing machine behind me. This allows us to predict how the sound is modified by my head and ears, building up a personalized model of my HRTF over time. So what does this look like in the wild? Um, so this is an example from one of our user studies where we have a listener wearing earbuds and there's just some music playing in the room. And this music, it could be coming from anywhere. And as she just kind of rotates her head about passively, uh, we're able to build up a model of our HRTF. So formally what that looks like is you have a sound source coming uh, from some direction, and you record the left and right channel audio uh, from the earbuds. And then we train a UNET model, which is the same one that, uh, that Lu Yang was using. The UNET model is great. Um, we train it to predict how the sound is being filtered. And the key observation is that we're able to take advantage of intraoral time differences so the, um, the, sorry, intraoral level differences. So the sound is slightly different between the two ears and it also changes slightly over time. So all of that provides clues as to how our head and ears were filtering the sound. And the sound source doesn't even need to be a like constant white noise or washing machine. This music is very dynamic, it's changing, but we're still able to predict it uh, with high fidelity. And as we capture more data, so we aggregate all this data into an HRTF so that as you capture more and more data, it just builds up a more accurate model of your head-related transfer function. Um, now, how do we actually measure how good, this how good our, our method is? So we conducted a user study where we had eight users in regular indoor environments, um, and it took about 15 minutes of playing audio to build up the HRTF because each measurement is a little bit noisy. Um, so the user just passively rotated their head through various positions. Um, and we also used the anechoic chamber to collect their ground truth HRTF. And we run a few comparisons. So in this graph, we show um, the blue line represents the user's ground truth HRTF. So we measured this in a very controlled environment. And the orange line represents what we predicted from just having them rotating their head passively in different environments. And you can see qualitatively that it matches up very closely. Um, and quantitatively, we're able to measure the difference between them and show that our method outperforms a number of methods. Um, and a lot of these other methods require a lot more information than we require. Um, and then, you know, why were we actually doing this? Well, it's, it's for rendering virtual sounds, right? So let's use this HRTF to render virtual sounds and see if we can actually trick the user into thinking it's coming from certain directions. So we played a sound through headphones, and it was rendered randomly some direction in space. Uh, and we asked the user to predict, is it coming from in front of you, or is it coming from behind you? Um, and we can see here three results. So generic means we're using a random HRTF. So it's, it could be somebody else's. Um, it's just a random one from a database. And the user is getting it wrong about 29% of the time, they can't tell if the sound in their headphones is supposed to be rendered in front or behind. With our method, that error is cut in about half to 14.8%. And the baseline, of course, is when you measure their HRTF very carefully, um, they're able to get it right over 90% of the time. And then the last test we did is not just front and back, but actually they have to tell you where the sound is coming from. So they're wearing the headphones, and a sound is rendered somewhere in space. And then we're asking them to point where they think it's coming from. And this is a sort of artistic rendering, thanks to Dali, of, of what our setup looked like. Um, this is what it actually looked like. We had tape markings at different angular intervals, and the user would rotate their head and point. And these are at five degree intervals uh, where they think they're coming from. And those were on all four sides. Um, so here's the results of that. And there's, again, three, um, the, the blue, orange, and the green bars. So the generic HRTF has the highest error 
Um, so you can look here on the, on the left-hand side. About 22.8 degrees is the average error that you'll point out when you're just using a random HRTF. The one we predict for you, uh, your angular error is about 15 degrees. And with the ground truth HRTF, it's about 13.6 degrees. Um, so again, showing that the HRTF that we're predicting for you allows you to localize sounds very well. Uh, thank you. We have time for maybe one question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this seems to um, do well on uh, creating an accurate HRTF to like the human, uh, individualized human. Yeah. Um, is there any, do you think there's any potential for taking the HRTF and mapping it further to increase human performance on localization? Like, um, you mean like enhancing the HRTF further or do you mean human localization like in the real world? Uh, or you're still talking about with virtual sounds? Like, um, I don't know if I'm... Uh, I didn't quite understand. Yeah, yeah, so like if I have, you know, AirPods or yeah. sorry, something more sophisticated that is in real time tra translating the audio into yeah. my ears and it uh, in such a way that I'm actually able to yeah. better increase my like localization ability in real time, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So, so that that's what happens right now um, is that you you take the HRTF and then the sounds in your AirPods are getting rendered with your HRTF so that you can uh, localize them. Um, the problem, of course, is obtaining that HRTF. So that is actually happening um, right now. Your AirPods have a spatialized feature, and so you can actually like, you know, even if you're just like watching a Twitter video or something, you can like simulate as if it's coming from the right or the left side, but it's um, by default using a generic HRTF to render that. It's like someone, something just measured from a, a average human head. There's the ideal HRTF, which is like matches exactly. What oh you yeah, yeah. And then is there something that's even better that would oh, increase I beyond human performance? I I understand the question. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Like superhuman, like yeah. superhuman performance. Humans are really good in in actual performance. Um, so I know the numbers I showed the ground truth HRTF. That's still from the render time. But if you actually do this experiment, the angular error is about five degrees or, or less. So I think beating that's pretty hard. Um, but that's a good question. Like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yes. All right, one last question. Yeah. So um, you have developed a method which uses um, equipment that a lot of us are, are wearing in our everyday lives. And, yeah. Um, uh, just out, also outside. Um, uh, just walking on the street. Yeah. Is um, uh, is being able to render more realistic sound with this with, with this um, equipment a security issue? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, there are implications for privacy. Imagine it's it's capturing. You know, you're like sitting in your lab and there's like some music and it's just like capturing that whole thing. Um, that might have security concerns for people, um, especially because it requires a good bit of audio to make it accurate. Like it's not just like you, you do it like once, it sort of passively needs like 15 minutes of audio. So it could have um, privacy implications for listeners to, to use this method. Yeah. It's like simulating that, oh gosh, there's something coming from behind and now I have this physical reaction to it. I, I do some movement like um, outside. Or like, I don't know, like, like you were talking yourself about tricking users into things. Yeah, like, yeah. So, Right, right. Like sometimes if you're listening to something, it's like a car honking, but it's actually coming from the song, and you actually, oh wait, was there a car honking behind me? Uh, that could be a, a potential concern. That's a, more of a concern with just spatial audio in general. That's true. Thank you, Vivek. Awesome. <laughs> and last but not least, Jaffe, please. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jaffe. I'm a second year PhD. Uh, working with Tita Fox and Ranjay Krishnan. So today I'll be presenting on my research, which is to democratize robot learning for all. So I think we are all very familiar with the capability of foundational models. So we have seen their ability in vision, language, you know, even generating codes for us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But the question, have you wondered, what is a foundational model for robotics? So you know, over the years of research, robotics has focused primarily on manipulation, on uh, tabletop settings, but 
you know, in reality, we want to have robots that's able to you know, do everyday household tasks for us, that are the comfort of our own home. And to be honest, my home looks more like something like this. So that makes the problem of robot manipulation even much harder. And you know, if you look at the current state of robotics, uh, a lot of times we actually borrow you know, data, or, you know, learning, uh, fe learn features from vision or language, and use that to actually fine tune a robot agent uh, with a set of pre-collected demonstrations or skills. So if you look at the pyramid of how much the data is being used, many comes from vision and language. So the question I'd like to ask is, can we flip this paradigm? Can we have more robotics data and maybe less of vision? So the bottleneck uh, before that is that uh, Kani researchers found that you know, uh, methods such as imitation learning works really well for especially long horizon tasks, which eventually hopefully will become uh, able to perform in our everyday house. But the main problem about these models is that it needs a lot of data, and it needs robot data. So this robot data exists in the form of demonstrations. And these demonstrations can be collected in various methods. You can do teleoperation and try to collect these uh, demonstrations by controlling a physical robot or you know, set up some kind of simulations. Or you can also get these kind of uh, demonstrations from you know, performing that task uh, and recording it as a video, or even have like, you know, sp uh, special device that's able to mimic a gripper of a robotic arm. Or uh, you know, other approach like mixed reality or even like you know, shared autonomy approach. But the question that we want to ask in our research project is that we do not want to use sim to real. We do not want to tally up a robot because uh, average robot, you know, to control it, first of all, you have to be trained. Secondly, the robot, uh, as you see over there, costs more than 20,000. And you don't want to really collect a bunch of video demonstrations. And definitely, you don't want to have like, a farm of robots trying to you know, collect a bunch of uh, you know, basic tasks. And lastly, OK. And you also don't want to use like your first person perspective videos to train such a robot. So we will present our project AR2D2, uh, training a robot without robot. Uh, this will be presented next week also at Cora. And the idea of this is really simple. Everyone has an iPhone. So the idea is that we create an iOS app that as a form of a data collection, it projects a virtual robot into a real space. And it allows the user to record a set of videos uh, condition on the language task that's you know given. So in this case, is to clean up the table, uh, clean up the coffee stain, and with the data that's collected from the iPad, uh, which I'll cover more about it later, uh, we are able to train uh, behavior cloning agents and to deploy that training process directly into the real world. So what is happening here? We actually remove the need to have a physical robot, and also you remove the need for someone to actually be specialized in training to operate a physical robot. So this is how the interface looks like. Uh, you open the app, and you basically carry out a, a series of actions. For example, for this task is to you know, press the torch, uh, press the button for the Minecraft torch, which you can't really do it in a lab setting because it's such a specialized object that only maybe exists in your own home. And from there, we are able to capture a diverse range of uh, data mortalities. So with that, we are, with some computer vision techniques, we are able to generate both the 2D data, which can be used to you know, train visual motor policies that learns from RGB, and also for, uh, to train like 3D-based uh, multitask transformers that learns from RGBD. So uh, once you go through the pipeline of generating this data, you will actually look as if a real robot is performing a task in the physical world, uh, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And with all this AR data that we are collected, we are able to actually uh, train a 3D-based multitask behavior cloning agent. Uh, here we use Perceivator. So basically what it does is that it takes in a 3D voxelized scene, and it tries to learn to predict the next best key point, which is also annotated with our AR app. And then it will actually be able to you know, take this model that's being trained. And all we need to do is just to fine tune, uh, do some rapid fine tuning on the real world, because after all, your iPad camera is pretty different from a camera that you see in a robotics lab. And with that, you're able to deploy that directly into the real world on a personalized object that was never really seen, uh, and which was never really seen during fine tuning, but was only captured in the AR data. So we are able to perform tasks as pressing you know, the objects. We are also able to do like, more complex tasks, like you know, picking up objects that's really unique, and also like, actions such as like, you know, pushing 
And uh, the result shows really interesting phenomena. It shows that we are able to perform in par with training on the real objects with a physical robot. So this actually gives a lot of bandwidth to you know, justify the point that maybe we do not really need a robot to collect those robot data. And that will actually help a lot in robotics, uh, robot learning. And you know, we also conducted an ablation study to look into, can you just train with uh, uh, 2D data? So we have like this 2D demonstration data that's collected. And we are able to also do like a zero shot deployment into the real world for a task like this. And of course, you know, like in robotics, we want to make the complexity of tasks to be as complicated as possible, uh, because like you, you never know what kind of task a human might need. So this is what it looks like when you train with AR data versus without the AR data for a task that requires quite a high level of precision. So in this task, you want to insert into the, the uh, tape holder. And we also realized that because we are able to collect 3D data, it actually generalized much well, uh, generate much better into robust environment. So the AR data looks totally different from this exact scene, which is like a different tabletop you know, with different objects, but it somehow it still works. And lastly, you know, we want to ask the question because in the future, we're going to collect a huge amount of data and we want to ask, does people really prefer this method over having a real robot in their house to collect this robot data? So we actually conducted a user study uh, with a, a size of 10 people. And we actually managed to figure out the question that, you know, first of all, how long does it take to collect such a demonstration using a real robot versus using our system? And we showed that you know, our speed performs in a comparable level as using a real robot. And also, you know, the preference of the, use, uh, of the user, they actually prefer to use our system as compared to having a physical robot. And uh, you know, so why do we need to scale up robot demonstration? Because as you know, ChatGPT, it shows that there is such thing as emergence in language when you scale up data, similar to vision when you try to scale up vision data for training, things like SAM. So the question that you know, bugs me every day is what happened? What would be the emergence in robotics if we really tries to scale up such demonstration data? And uh, there is some primary example that we see that you know, by looking at a model that's trained with this kind of demonstration, you can actually see that the model if you visualize the cross attention layer, you'll realize that the model is actually looking at a specific part of the handle, which is relevant to the context of the task. And if you zoom out and look at it from a bigger picture, doesn't this look like segmentation in computer vision? So the question that I would like to ask and to leave with everyone is that, you know, maybe it's time for robotics to give vision and language some kind of representation for learning. Thank you. Awesome. Um, any questions? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I have a question. Um, you showed the task having, like, you show, like, one waypoint that it goes to. Mm -hmm. um, we also deal with, like, sequential things, such as, I saw the push action. Is that, like, a sequence that we demonstrate? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so for push action, like, this we call it, like, primitive action, usually requires about two to three wave points during the demonstration phase. And that would be, uh, of course, as the complexity of the task increase, you know, you are going to have more wave points. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, I think it's a really neat idea. Oh, I thanks. Think, um, really like it. Um, however, so isn't there a problem with um, humans showing robots, robots how to perform a certain task the way that a human would do? Are there any tasks where aren't most tasks maybe preferably done for robots in a way that a robot might do it? Oh yeah, so I think that's a really excellent question. So the reason why we have such a visualization is because we realize that a lot of times when people are trying to teach a robot from the point of a human egocentric view, we always do tasks really easily. But we never really think of the physical constraint of a robot. You know, maybe the robot might not have a motion planner that's able to reach this pose. So that's why we inject this visualization phase into the app. So when you are teaching the robot, you are actually having a real-time feedback to see whether, first of all, is the robot able to physically do that task? And then the way you teach is going to be kind of different from me doing it as, you know, as a human. So that's the, one of the additional, I guess, like property from this system. Yeah. I was thinking about tasks where you picked up um, that, that uh, chess figure. Mm. I think that would be much easier for a human because of the friction and the sweat that we have. That oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I guess the, the robot doesn't have that. Oh, yeah, so that requires like, more additional sensors. Yeah. So for this one, we are looking more at quadrostatic. Uh, objects that's more rigid body, 
And of course, like, you know, if there's like a more requirement in terms of understanding of physics, then there will be some kind of limitation. Because after all, humans, the way the amount of force you apply on an object is pretty different from what that robotic arm is applying onto an object. At least without any additional sensors. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think we're we're definitely at time. So okay. why don't we conclude? Thank you, Jeff. Eh? Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. I hope you found this um, to be interesting and quite diverse in the the range of topics. And just one more round of applause for all of our speakers. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>